church. I am glad to see everybody here and kind of seeing people filter in because uh, we are all busy catching up before worship. Uh, but let me tell you, it is always a great day to come and worship the Lord together at Alden United Methodist Church, but it is an extra glorious day to worship the Lord together because uh, Chuck brought door prizes. I don't know any better word for it than that. Um, he has been cooking down maple syrup and has brought a bottle of maple syrup for each household to take home with them this morning. And he said, like, I know Chuck, he doesn't want people to know when he does good stuff, but he said he thought he would allow you to know that it's him that did it because sometimes people, you know, like to know where their food comes from if it's something home, homemade. Um, so those are out on the narthex table and uh, I will keep my visual aid with me. Uh, yep. All right, we also have Easter flower order forms. You guys, Easter is the end of this month. I know. I don't know about you, but I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so if you would like to order Easter flowers in honor or in memory of someone, this is how you order it. You can put it in the plate or give them to Deb after worship. Also, you might want to grab a pen or pencil out of your pew or out of your purse or out of your pocket because I have a few dates that did not make it into the back of the bulletin before it was published. Um, you do have the announcement about the 150th anniversary. Well, our uh, planning committee is going to be meeting for that on Thursday, this Thursday, which is the 7th, if you're writing down dates, um, and it will be at 2 p.m., and we will meet in the conference room. Also this week, which most people who are on Ad Board and Finance should know, Monday is Finance at 5, and Tuesday is Ad Board at 5. Um, and everyone's welcome to come to those, but uh, we have the usual cast of characters who need to come. Um, and then also looking ahead a little bit, uh, a week from Wednesday, which is the 13th, is our first UMW back to having UMW meetings for the year for 2024. A week from this Wednesday, it's the 13th. No, it's on Wednesday. So, and can I tell them tentatively the plan? Rita? Yeah. So tentatively, the plan is we are going to go uh, visit the Rapid City Food Pantry, and at 12.15, we're going to start with lunch, right? Right. We're going to start with lunch at the Rapid City Tavern, formerly known as Critters, because I know a lot of you, that's what comes to mind instead of the Rapid City Tavern. Um, we're going to have lunch, and then we will go tour the Rapid City Food Pantry, which is one of the great organizations that UMW supports with our fundraisers, our bake sales, and our great rummage sale. And so um, also I was told that uh, spouses are invited to come to this meeting if they want to see what great things are happening at the food pantry. Um, and are there any other announcements that I'm missing? What's the time on that? That is at 12.15 they don't open until 12 so the adult Sunday school immediately well immediately following coffee hour adult Sunday school immediately co following coffee hour in the room across the, the way all right I think that is everything are there any other announcements did you have one Jillian I just saw your hand go up I was like oh maybe she has something um, well, if we have no other announcements, oh, I didn't let you guys greet each other, did I? I'm all scared of because I have a whole list of extra stuff. I'm so glad to see you. I know you guys are glad to see each other. I invite you to greet your neighbors and remind them that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Good morning, kids. Good morning. Thank you. 
are fancy that you can see when you're just looking at regular dark things but then when it gets super bright they get black so can you see through the window over there can you see you can see out there no when you look at the light it gets really dark and you can't see anything right if you turn this way can you see them yeah? So, when you look at the light, can you look at the light again? Look at the light. When you look at the light, it's kind of like you're blind, right? Yeah? You want to get those off? Here, let me undo you. There you go. It's kind of like you're blind. And our story today is about a man who was born blind. And Jesus heals him with some mud and some spit in his eyes. Isn't that kind of gross? Yeah, that's really gross. But the thing is that Jesus talks about is it's not just this man who was blind. It's all the religious leaders who were like, well, he's a sinner because he healed him. And, you know, they were just all worried about all the other details other than this man could see again, this man who had been born blind. 
And so Jesus tells them that they are the ones who are really blind because Jesus doesn't say it quite this way, but I think since our welding helmet goes blind when you look at the light, they too were blind when they would look at the light of Christ because they couldn't see the good he was doing in the world. They just wanted to nitpick all the little rules that he was breaking by helping this guy. And shouldn't we be the ones who can see people who how they really are, who can see the good in them, who can see the light in them, who can see the God in them, who can see how God is at work in their lives, how the Holy Spirit is moving? Yeah? I thought the welding thing was kind of fun. So, should we pray the way Jesus taught us so that we might always remember to see the world through God's eyes instead of through our own human eyes that sometimes don't allow us to see the light in people? Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh man, you may go sit down. All right, so what prayers and praises are on your hearts? I know we have a lot this week. Um, one I wanted to start out with, it's actually from the Central Lake Church, but many of you know uh, Jean, uh, his wife from the book club and some of the other things we've done on Zoom. Uh, her husband, Jim, was in the ICU with pneumonia this week. He is, praise God, back at home, but he still has some recovery. So we pray for continued healing for Jim Ganey. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? Prayers for the family of Isla Collins who passed away this week. Prayers for comfort for that family in their grief. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Nada? Prayers for Lucy Howard who in the bad So, and that was Lucy Collins? Howard. 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 All right, so prayers for Lucy Howard, who we prayed for last week, that she was in that terrible car accident, and she is still in the hospital recovering, but doing better, and she's had one surgery on her neck, and there are some more to come. Um, so we pray continued healing on her, and that all those surgeries go well and she recovers quickly and easily. Lord, in your mercy. Tina? Continued prayers for John James Barbier for his healing. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers? Continued prayers for Dorothy Walter. I saw her this week, and she's doing very well. I expect she'll be home this week, but I'm not a doctor. Um, so we pray that God would continue to heal Dorothy. Lord, in your mercy. Continued prayers for Gar and Kevin Lane. Prayers for healing their cancer. Lord, in your mercy. So the nurse came in to see Elena, and the nurse called Elena the Energizer Bunny because she's doing so well. 
And so um, prayers for Elena, but especially prayers for all of her family and those who love her as uh, we are all getting ready to say goodbye for now. Lord, in your mercy. Diane? As he continues his email. Okay. Continued prayers for Evan Nemeth. Um, as he continues his chemo treatments, we pray that they do all of the things that uh, the doctors hope and with minimal or few side effects. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts this week? Traveling mercies for all those who are on the roads and in the sky. Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? I praise God for the beautiful weather. I know it, we're not supposed to like this. It's not supposed to be like this, but I am enjoying it, and I praise God for it. Lord, in your mercy. Jay? For people who are dealing with war. Prayers for all of those. Prayers for all those who are in war zones and that God might protect them and keep them safe until we can be a world at peace. Lord, in your mercy. Also, I think we should lift up prayers for those in Texas for their wildfires. Um, I know they've had two deaths, and so for those who are grieving and those who have been hurt and have lost so much, we lift them up to God. Lord, in your mercy. Well, you may have very good vision. We'll talk about that a little later. Everybody needs a little Jesus, right? All right. If there are no other prayers to be spoken aloud, let's go to God in silent prayer, knowing that God knows all that's on our hearts and in our minds. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, source of all light, we come to you this day seeking restoration of our sight. God of great mercy and love, we lift up to you all those who we have named before you and those whose names we don't know, but who are in need of your touch in their lives. Lord, heal our blindness and give us a picture-perfect perspective of all that we can accomplish in your name. Give us strength and confidence to truly witness to your abiding love and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in our prayer response. Number 349, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Scripture today is the ninth chapter 
of John. It's going to be long. I didn't prepare it, and I will do the best I can. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming and when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, smeared the mud on the man's eyes. And Jesus said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to beg him, see him when he was a beggar said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. And others said, no, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He said, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe that the man had been blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, that is incredible. You don't know where he's from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God, God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. 
no one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. Jesus heard they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? He answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see and those who will see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, Surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. So, that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That was long. Yes, it was. I had to get the whole story. <laughs> well, an extra thanks to Jean for pinch hitting because I screwed up and didn't get the um, scripture out to the original person, and so uh, Jan was filling in and did a great job. <laughs> Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be measured and found pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is the fourth Sunday in Lent already. And today, is it the fourth Sunday or is it the third? It's the third Sunday in Lent. Oh, another week. Third Sunday in Lent. Today we're continuing our baggage series and are you starting to figure out when you need what type of bag and what you need to pack in it? Because we looked at what to fill our backpack with in order to be prepared to face temptation with Jesus. And we've hit the gym in order to be transformed through Jesus. And this week we have a camera bag. And just about all of us can snap a picture these days wherever we are. Most of us, have these, right? So who has these with them? If you have one, how about you take it out and snap a selfie with the person next to you? And I'm going to put this camera down because it's just in my way. I need to stop. All right, so those of you who took pictures, look at your picture. And what's in the background that maybe you didn't notice when you were taking the picture? Is there anything or anyone behind you that you didn't know was there? So I have a little test for you, a little video to see how observant all of you really are. And you gotta pay attention. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? It's not very bright, you can't see the ball. Yeah. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Better if your screen was better. <laughs> I know, it's kind of dim. I made it extra hard, I guess. 
But I have to tell you, when I watched it on a regular screen, I'll post it on Facebook after I get back from Central Lake so you guys can watch the video on your computer screens and stuff. But when I watched this, I was convinced that they added the bear in the second time they played the video. And it was not in that first video, because I'm usually pretty observant. It is totally there in the first video if you go back and rewatched it. Um, clearly, I was blind, but now I see, right? Now every time I see it, I can see the breakdancing bear. And have you ever marveled at photos that are taken by professional photographers? Have you ever noticed all the little details that they capture that you might not have noticed before? And in today's text from the Bible, Jesus gives sight to a man who was born blind. And in the story, the disciples have a limited picture of who this man is, asking if it was sin or his parents' sin that made him this way. And Jesus tells them it was neither. This man was born blind so that others might see through the miracle that Jesus provides in giving him sight. And this exposes the man to a world he has never known before. Have you seen any of the videos out there of the people who are colorblind and they get those new glasses where they can see color and their faces? And I just this week saw a video, which I should have brought it and put it up here because it's adorable, um, of babies who were blind, well, they weren't blind, but they were very far-sighted or near-sighted, and they put glasses on the babies, and they saw their mothers for the first time with glasses on, and all these babies' faces light up, and they start laughing. I might put that one on Facebook, too. Um, it's an amazing thing when you couldn't see something, and now you can. And so um, it has an enormous impact on all those who have seen this blind man over all the years. They can now see things that they had never recognized in him. And I kind of love this story of Jesus healing the blind man. I think in large part because of my grandma's 13 brothers and sisters, half of them went, were blind, at least by the time I knew them. They went blind in adolescence. Um, in our family, we have a recessive gene that causes a disease called retinitis pigmentosa that causes people to go blind as teens and young adults. And it's kind of the opposite of macular degeneration, which I can't remember. One, you can't see your peripheral. The other, you can't see your central. Um, but all my life, I knew my great aunts and uncles as being blind and grew up taping on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes letters to my Aunt France and my Aunt Marg that my grandma would mail off to them in free mail for the blind. And also, my mom's very best friend from childhood, um, she had parents who were both blind and they lived four doors down from my grandparents. And so for holidays, we would go down and see Mr. and Mrs. Anstead, um, and especially on Halloween, we would go down and they would see with their hands our Halloween costumes, and they kind of loved that. That was something they looked forward to and kind of something we looked forward to as kids. And as a child, I literally hoped that Jesus would heal the blindness of these people that I loved because I couldn't imagine not being able to see, especially being a voracious reader as a kid because I would see the braille books, which I don't know if you've ever seen braille books, but it can take a little leaflet this big and it's a book this big and that big in order to get all the braille in there. And I completely missed the spiritual blindness that Jesus was talking about in the scripture. Now, before technology gave us high-powered cameras that would automatically focus and fit on the phone in our pocket, it took training and skill and a good eye and often more than a few tries to take a perfect picture with your average camera. Although you didn't sit and shoot 15 pictures of the same picture like we do now because it's digital, or that one's a digital camera. I should have brought my old uh, single lens reflex 35 millimeter camera because in high school,
in order to fix stuff you didn't take right out of the camera. Now you just get on one of the editing things and you can edit stuff to your heart's content. And so it took all of that in order to get a perfect picture with your average camera. And before we had these, I would take pictures of my crowd because, you know, taking pictures for a family of 10 now, then it was probably six, eight, um, I would take pictures and I would swap heads with the best one because it never failed with a big family. Somebody would have a face like that. And so I would have to put them all together. I could never get a perfect shot with a big family. And so you get with a point and shoot camera what the camera focuses on. But with a more sophisticated 35 millimeter camera, you can adjust this and change that and focus on stuff and adjust the lighting and adjust the film speed, although they don't call it film speed on these because it's not film anymore. Um, you can do all kinds of things to make your picture turn out. And so you can take pictures of the exact same thing and have every picture turn out totally different. So if Jesus' encounter with the man who was born blind, maybe the moment of conversion or the physical manifestation of that, it's less important, I think, than the difference it makes. Because conversions can be messy, and it's particularly messy in this story, right? Because Jesus spat on the ground and made mud and put it in the guy's eye. I mean, anybody else kind of going, ooh, yeah. Like, I don't want somebody spit in my eye. I don't want my own spit in my eye. And maybe more importantly, and it doesn't always sound convincing, but just because you had a holy moment with mud doesn't mean the rest of us will, right? But while the conversion that happens may not be describable, the difference from before and after totally is. This man can tell the difference it makes. He talks about what others can see and hear for themselves. And so let the description of the before and after be the thing. Because once I believed this, and now my eyes are opened, and here is what I see and I know. And once the individuals blurred together into a stereotype, now I see the details of how each person that I see is unique. Anglican Bishop N.T. Wright asks, who decides when the picture is in focus? This is ultimately a question of authority, a question of judgment. In the Gospel of John and throughout the New Testament, it is Jesus himself who has this right. The work of bringing God's judgment to bear on the world, of setting things to right and bringing the picture into focus, was often regarded by Jewish thinkers as the proper work of the Messiah. Ironically, the position of this man's accusers, the hardline Pharisees, is then fully exposed. They have constructed a system within which they will never see that they are wrong. It is one thing to be genuinely mistaken and to be open to new evidence. It is another to create a closed world like a sealed room in which no light can come in from the outside. Often in crime scenes, the eyewitnesses have such different observances of the same event that police detectives have to wonder if eyewitnesses saw the same thing. Interestingly enough, I have been told by many police detectives that if everybody's story is exactly the same, they know they're lying because everyone sees different things at the very same time of the exact same thing. So I have a second video for you to see, and I think you'll be able to see it a little better than the first one, to see how well you can see right what is right in front of you. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe. Who? At precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But 
I was wanting my petunias in a potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how would you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take it away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts and precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was punishing the grass in the last <coughs> I was buttering his lordship's scones with a stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Transfer to London has some great commercials for sermon illustrations. So what did you guys see? What got changed? Well, the guy on the, the deck guy got changed. The deck guy got changed. Yeah. The, tablecloth. the tablecloth on the table with the flowers. The, the love seat or sofa. Yep. Chair got moved. Yep. The bear turned into a knight or a suit of armor. And the other ones? I've watched this 42 million times. Did you see them flipping the, the portraits in the background? They flipped the portraits. Um, there was a dead animal hanging on the wall, trophy that got swapped. Um, the clock by the dead guy changed. The rug the dead guy was laying on changed. Uh, the butler was holding a rolling pin in the beginning, and then he was holding one of the candlesticks in the next one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any more off the top of my head. But none of us noticed that, right? Or maybe you noticed one or two. Did anybody notice anything the first time through? Just the thing laying next to the guy's head. I wouldn't know. Oh, the, the clock? Yeah. The clock changing. But you didn't notice the guy, dead guy changing, huh? So often when we look at things, they're not always as they seem. Who decides if the picture's in focus? Photographer. How about Jesus? Oh yeah, only by looking through the lens who is Jesus over and over again can we be sure that we are standing alongside that man who was born blind in his newborn faith and openness to God's life, which is the making of a perfect picture. May we all see with the eyes of Jesus. Amen. What did I do with my bulletin? See, my skills of observation aren't so hot either. There we go. All right, if you would take a moment to prepare for our um, great Thanksgiving, to prepare for Holy Communion, there is a um, prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Oops, if I get a book of worship and not a hymnal. Will you join with me in our prayer of confession? Healing God, we have languished in our blindness. We have chosen to hide in the darkness of self-pity, disappear into the shadows of anxiety, escape into the cave of isolation. We are afraid of the light, let we are drawn to it. Forgive our lack of fear and our fearfulness, O Lord. Give us courage to step into the light and adjust our focus. For in its rays are healing and hope, 
restoration and transformation. May our lives be transformed by your mercy, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to offer up those things that burden you and your brokenness silently to God. Even though you have lived in darkness, God's light is being poured out for you. Accept the light and love that is freely offered and be transformed by its healing mercies. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remains steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast, that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offered ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out the Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All power and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This table 
You guys know this isn't our table at Alden United Methodist Church. It's not even the table of the United Methodist Church. This table is Christ's table, and Christ invites anyone who wants to know him to come and share in this foretaste of heaven. And in the Methodist Church, we use grape juice so that we can be a ministry with children and those who struggle with alcohol. But you may come now, for all is ready, and uh, something special I noticed when I came in last night to prepare, there are lovely, cushy cushions in front of the kneeling rails. And so if you are somebody whose knees maybe don't like going down to kneel, um, you might give it a try and appreciate some time at the kneeling rail to be with Jesus and pray. Um, we're going to take communion this morning by intinction, which just means that you rip off a piece of bread and you dip it in the juice. Um, you don't need to touch the bread. I can hold on to it. So just touch the piece that you are ripping. And uh, as I always like to remind the children, don't be afraid to take a big piece of Jesus. And Deb has the sealed communion elements if you would prefer those. William, this means Jesus loves you.
oh, time for our morning offering. Actually, let's pray first. Loving and holy God, we give thanks for this foretaste of heaven, this chance to commune with the body of Christ, those who are already with you and those around the world with whom we worship together. God, we pray that as you fill us with the bread and the wine, that you might fill us too with your love and your hope and your peace and your grace and your joy. That we might be so full that it overflows out of us so that everyone who meets us might see you at work in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us offer up our offerings to God in response to all that God has done for us. resources that we bring today and all the resources that you have given to us to give sight to those who are blind inside and outside our church building. Open our eyes, open our minds, and open our hearts, Lord, so that we may see our neighbors as you see them. Help us accept your call to open blinded eyes so that all may see. Use these gifts and use us to do your work in the world and build your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I have just a couple of quick things uh, before we do our hymn and our benediction. The first is next Sunday is Daylight Savings Time, our favorite time of year to lose an hour of sleep. Um, so you might want to put that on your calendars and remember so you um, are here at the right time next Sunday. The second thing I was going to say at the end of my sermon, and I kind of forgot because I didn't write it down, as Rita so astutely saw, there are little Jesuses all around the church building. And now I did not hide them. It's just that Jesus shows up in the most unexpected places. The other thing is everybody needs a little Jesus, right? And so if you find a little Jesus, you are welcome to take little Jesus. You are welcome to leave little Jesus. And if you take little Jesus, you are welcome to pass him along to somebody who you think needs a little Jesus. Now here's the fun part that when my brain gets going at 2 a.m., uh, what I plan to do, I'm hoping to go order more because 100 little Jesuses isn't nearly enough. Um, and I'm going to put a little card on little Jesus with a, with a QR code, and I know a lot of you aren't into QR codes, but it's going to have a link to our website, and, you know, we'll put everybody needs a little Jesus on there, and I'm going to put a Google form so people can say where they found little Jesus, because he's going to be all around Alden. So as we have all our tourists and visitors and guests coming this summer, they'll know that Alden United Methodist Church is spreading a little Jesus in our community. Um, and if you would like to be part of making sure Jesus shows up in unexpected places, because I know we have a lot of little doors around our town, um, let me know. Um, and also if you want to pitch in, because I've just been buying them, because I think they're fun as all get out. Um, and it's been lovely to take them to some shut-ins who say, you know, to say, I think you could use a little Jesus and then whip little Jesus out of my pocket. Um, so you get to test your vision, your powers of observation, see if you can see or if you are blind. Um, and Jesus may just turn up in the most unexpected of places. 
Um, I just think it's a lot of fun and a great way to get the word about our church out in the community. All right, don't forget daylight savings time next week. Let's join together in our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See.